Hi, I'm Justy. Welcome back to The Skeptheist, an ongoing series of videos in which we discuss the concepts of skepticism and atheism. Who am I? That's irrelevant to tonight's discussion, but if you're interested, here's the sort of thing I like to do. Check this out! Now that's out of the way, let's talk about the perception of skepticism. Today's discussion about the perception of skepticism has two intended audiences. One, skeptics, and two, non-skeptics. For the skeptics, it's all about how we can improve the perception of skepticism. And to the non-skeptics, it's all about giving you a better idea of what skepticism truly is. So let's cover first of all the knowledge of skepticism. At one end of the spectrum we have a complete lack of knowledge or ignorance of skepticism. And in that case, a, a, a vacuum of knowledge forms, and it's all too often filled with synthesized information. In other words, information that's extracted from, from nowhere. And further up the spectrum, we have a, a misinterpretation of the concepts of, of skepticism, uh, myths and, and uh, falsehoods that are, are propagated about skepticism. So let's talk about some common myths and misconceptions surrounding skeptics. So we're talking about people here, not necessarily the idea of skepticism. The first myth is that skeptics are closed-minded. This myth is only true insofar as skeptics are closed-minded to nonsense. And we say that it's important to have an open mind, but not so open that your brains fall out. And what this essentially means is that there should be a balance between believing absolutely everything that you hear and believing absolutely nothing that you hear. In episode one, we covered this in terms of the way of escaping the philosophical loop. I would argue, of course, that this is the core of being a skeptic or being a scientist or any modality which is iterative, which constantly looks for flaws in its own reasoning and seeks to eliminate them. A skeptic attempts as best as he or she or it, let's imagine that there will be artificially intelligent skeptics one day, to not fool themselves. Another common misconception about skeptics is that they're cynics. This is simply not true. It is entirely possible to be a non-skeptical cynic or a skeptical cynic. All permutations, of course, are possible. The two concepts aren't equivalent. Closely related to this is the misconception that all that skeptics do is debunk claims. So it's important for us to show that yes, debunking is an important part of skepticism, but it doesn't end there. And in any case, even if this claim were true, we need debunkers in our society to shoot down erroneous claims. Another way to put a positive spin on this is that debunking isn't necessarily negative. If somebody's making a claim about the efficacy of a certain remedy or medicine, and we know it's not true, it really is a positive thing to debunk that claim. Another misconception might be that skeptics are arrogant. It's pretty easy to see how this comes about. A skeptic is, generally speaking, all too happy to point out the logical fallacies in somebody's argument, the fact that the facts they have at their fingertips are not facts, they're, they're falsehoods, um, that everything they know is wrong, that there's no basis for their conceptual framework. This may not actually be a misconception in some cases. But they're idiots, so who cares? Another accusation that might be leveled at skeptics is that they're argumentative. But once again, the ambiguity of language causes problems here. On the, on the one hand, an argumentative person might be someone who's keen to pick a fight for no particular reason. But on the other hand, an argumentative person is simply someone who's using logical arguments. So being argumentative isn't necessarily negative. It could also possibly be said of skeptics that they're trying to spread like some zombie virus their own particular ideology. But I would argue this is true of pretty much everyone. If you've ever had someone who's enthusiastically religious come to your door on a Sunday and attempt to implant their philosophy into your brain, you'll know that it's quite easy to recoil reflexively from this. And indeed the same could be said of skeptics. If an incredibly enthusiastic skeptic came to your door and said, have you read this book? Demon Haunted World by Carl Sagan, or Flim Flam by James Randi, you might have a similar reaction. And so superficially, these two types of activity might appear identical. However, the difference is that skepticism has a meta level. It's about philosophies. It's not just a philosophy. It's a philosophy that, that crunches through other philosophies, assesses them, and keeps the parts that are uh, rational and logical and dismisses the rest. It may actually be the case that really the only thing that we want to get rid of is fundamentalism. And by the way, if you're of the opinion that a skeptic is a fundamentalist, once again, you haven't understood the concept of skepticism. Skepticism is only fundamentalist in that it is fundamentally non-fundamentalist. 
We could roll all of these into one and say that skeptics are mean. Skeptics don't want me to be healthy. They don't want me to talk to my departed relative. They don't want me to um, be able to feel happy and fulfilled in my particular modality. So I would like to be a positive skeptic. How can I be a positive skeptic? Well, by not dwelling on any particular debunk or any particular you know, dismissal of a claim, not getting um, angry with people when they exhibit completely illogical behavior. So now we come to the skeptic's dilemma. Let's suppose for a moment that you have a friend that you like very much and you find out one day that they have an irrational belief, a belief that is simply not supported by evidence. You've got a problem. You like them, but eventually that issue is going to come up, isn't it? How do you deal with it? I won't pretend that I have all the answers for all possible situations here, but I will say that a general strategy is to think before you speak. Weigh up the pros and cons of either ignoring it completely and just liking them for who they are, biting your tongue when they mention that their horoscope told them that today would be a good day and it was a good day. Or on the other hand, you might feel that their life is in danger because they're taking some quack remedy that you know is not going to do them any good and distracts from real medicine. In that case, the best thing to do might be to confront them to be very straight and frank with them, that you're concerned about their choices and that it's because you care about them that you're concerned and to at least listen to what you have to say. So let's talk now about the perception of atheists and the perception of theists. So one misconception about atheists is that they have no morals. But I think that this misconception is not only untrue, but it's very offensive. And Richard Dawkins, amongst others, argues against this and says that essentially that morals are actually a, an evolved consequence of the need to look after each other. So let's talk about misconceptions about theists. One misconception is that they are only all about a supernaturalistic worldview. I'll cite the example here of Ken Miller. Ken Miller would never stand up in front of a group of people and attempt to attribute magic to the mechanism of a cell's inner workings. But he is a Catholic. He is a man of cloth. It's all too easy to make overly general statements. I've just made one now. But one of those general statements might be that science and religion are like oil and water. They have no interconnectivity. So this highlights another issue, which we'll have to wait until another podcast, of separating religion and science. What does that mean? I think it's important to separate certain concepts and put them into frameworks. Otherwise, the ambiguity and, and misinterpretation runs rampant and we don't get anywhere. So as a skeptic, I sincerely encourage you to do everything you can to improve the perception of you as a skeptic. After all, you're helping skepticism by doing this. And remember, the best way to spread an idea is to make it seductive. Do everything you can to improve your image as a skeptic. I'd like to use my skepticism to improve the world. That's a bit of a lofty goal, I must admit. However, I firmly believe that with the correct combination of a rational mindset and an open, creative way of approaching problems, i.e. not just being a cynic and not just being close-minded to new ideas, we can truly advance as a species. And finally, I'll say that if you're able to remain completely calm during the discussion with someone of an opposing viewpoint, that's a level of civility of which you can be especially proud. So I hope you've had a good time listening to this special nighttime edition of The Skeptheist. Please follow The Skeptheist on Twitter at twitter.com slash skeptheist. Hi, I'm Justin. Wearing glasses makes me appear more intelligent. Welcome to The Skeptheist. Skeptical botanists, have you planted the healthy seeds of true doubt in your friends yet? Return in a few weeks and see how they've grown. Remember to water them regularly. For any hidden conspiracy camera nuts out there, what are you looking at? I really... Mm. <laughs>